Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, modeling focus screen propagation in scattering media. So during this lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about focus beam propagation in free space, then in scattering media, and I'm going to talk about uh, why we need computational models uh, in focus beam propagation. After that, I'm going to uh, introduce Maxwell's equation, then how we get the wave equation from Maxwell's equation, then talk about plane wave solution and properties of plane wave, and uh, then high one from principle. Once we have all those fundamental components, we combine those things to uh, develop this uh, focus beam propagation model we develop here. I think we need to turn off those slides. Can you turn off this? Because this one. Are these slides? Okay. So, in this case, uh, this is a simple focus beam setup. Uh, we will have collimated beam coming on and bounced back by this mirror and then passing through the objective and create a, a small high intensity spot, that is a focal spot, that is an important part of this uh, microscopy. And its amplitude is something like that, if you use force color then it will look like that. So the shape is a cigar shape and then uh, the phase distribution is like that. So uh, this is the focus beam propagation in phase space. And we can model this one using analytical solution. Uh, we can consider this incident beam. We can consider this uh, incident beam uh, as a, a plane wave, and then it incident upon its lens, and then it will be a converging uh, spherical wave and propagate toward the focus. Uh, this analytical solution for that one, using that analytical equation, we can model something like this. So we can get each slice and we can obtain uh, the uh, electric field uh, distribution at any location in this focal volume. The problem comes when we do this one in a scattering medium. So this scattering medium, uh, in this case I put two scatterers just to display how this focal volume is distorted. I use the model we developed to uh, do the simulation. Uh, in earlier case, we, we can see a very nice symmetric focus beam propagation, but in this case, this uh, plane is highly distorted. So the beam is highly distorted. Because of that, this in, uh, center intensity is attenuated and it may be shifted into different locations, so we get different information now. So the, the scattering distort the excitation volume and also it limit the penetration depth and also uh, uh, limit the resolution. So uh, in this case we have only two scatterers, but consider when we have multiple scatterers. So this is the problem we actually want to solve. So this is the place we want to we want to bring our models so that we can get some insight about this uh, scattering problem and then use that information to mitigate scattering or design or develop a different technique to uh, do better schemes so that you have seen this uh, chart before this morning so in this uh, chart, uh, we have all the microscopy techniques on this left-hand side. And in this technique, the coherent nature of light is very important. So that means we, we, have, to use, we have to consider uh, light as an electromagnetic wave in this region. It means we have to use Maxwell's equation. So, but, uh, well, some, uh, some people use this RTE in this region, but when we try to put the RTE in, the, in this region, uh, we are losing the accuracy because uh, RTE kind of model the coherent nature of the light. So, so 
So the first thing is to look at what kind of models are available to, uh, what kind of techniques are available to model focus screen propagation. This is one technique, finite difference time domain solution for Maxwell's equation or FTTD. And this is known as the gold standard. What this does is uh, when you are interested in certain volume, uh, we take that way by small size of boxes. So let's consider we have like 100 micron by 100 micron by 100 micron volume. Then we represent that, that one by small voxels, and the, the size of this voxel has to be lambda by 20 or smaller to get accurate results. So that means if you is 50 nanometers. So consider you want to make by 100 micron, that means 2,000 voxels on each side. So 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000 means small volumes, 100 micron by 100 micron by 100 micron is a small volume, but we need a large amount of voxels and we need a large So we, this is a Addition to that, there are some staircase errors because when we use voxel to model three, we have this kind of a staircase errors. Another model is using Monte Carlo simulation. So this is we, uh, in this case we use RTD and try to apply in this region. So the problem is in our, uh, Monte Carlo simulation we don't consider So the far field phase function. Far field phase function is when, you, when, is, uh, when there's a scatter, uh, light incident upon that scatter and provide the field, electric field or antidote distribution. It can be uh, it, uh, and non outward. When we consider far field uh, phase function, we get the antidote distribution far away from that scatter. But uh, in that case, we are going to miss some uh, places close to the scatter. So uh, that's another problem in quantum color simulation. And also it provides a new behavior, not the specific scatter pattern. Uh, and we need large number of photons. So I'm going to talk about this uh, concept, equation and properties. Uh, I'm going to talk about electromagnetic wave, Maxwell's equation, and flame wave. So light is an electromagnetic wave, and it has an electric field and magnetic field uh, perpendicular to each other, and the propagation direction is perpendicular to both electric field and magnetic field. The distance between two peaks is known as the wavelength. So uh, let's go over uh, the Maxwell's equation briefly. Uh, so uh, because Maxwell equa equations are uh, the theoretical foundation of optics, because it provides exact uh, model of electromagnetic wave propagation. And when we consider this first two equation, and we consider the propagation in free space, that means no flow of current, we can write this second equation like that, and combining first two equation, we can obtain the wave equation. Uh, and there are a lot of preferences for this one, so I'm not going to explain uh, the Maxwell's equation in detail. And so the important thing is what, what are the solutions for this wave equation? We take one solution that is plane wave 
And we can write uh, the plane wave solution in two forms. One is cosine form, and the one is in sine form. And I'm going to use cosine form for this lecture. Uh, so this is one solution for wave equation. And when you consider the plane wave, it has an amplitude and phase. And uh, uh, this amplitude is the maximum value of, uh, uh, of this wave. And the phase is the phase shift uh, uh, of that wave. And uh, for this kind of wave, we can calculate the intensity. Intensity is a cross product of electric field and the magnetic field. And we can represent it as uh, half uh, epsilon naught c e naught squared. So the intensity is proportional to E naught squared. That means intensity is proportional to electric field. So we can use electric field in, uh, for our own modeling. So we can eliminate the magnetic field and we can use only the electric field for our modeling. So the, what I'm coming is uh, we, we try to model this one and we are trying to find all the And when you want to do a computer program and run that program. So when this plane wave is in this original uh, function, when you put that function into the computer program, it will give a value, just a value, you know, cosine kc minus omega, this, it provides certain value, but it does not give to then phase at that point. To do that, to, to find the amplitude and phase, we represent this wave as a complex vector. To uh, represent this one as a complex vector, we add a complex part. So this will be a vector, and then in complex form, uh, complex plane, uh, this uh, x projection is the real part, y projection is the imaginary part. Uh, and so we can write this uh, plane wave in this form. Now, when we input this one into our program, whenever we need the amplitude, we can use this equation and calculate the amplitude. And we can calculate the arc tangent of this ratio to find the phase. That, uh, that's why we represent a plane wave in, comple uh, in complex form. And uh, this is a long equation, to, uh, so simplify this equation by using Euler's formula. And in Euler's formula, you can write E naught exponential, and then use I here to represent complex value, and then phi is the phase. So here on, I use this form to uh, represent the uh, represent plane wave. Another important aspect of the plane wave is polarization. So polarization is described by specifying orientation of the electric field. So in this case, the electric field is oriented horizontally. That means it oscillates in horizontal way. So this is uh, horizontally polarized or x-polarized light. That uh, means E x, there is a uh, electric field value for Ex, and Ey is the perpendicular field, so uh, it is perpendicular to the ele this electric field, then it is equal to zero. So, we someone wants to consider polarization in Xz plane, that means this plane, then the, the E parallel, this is supposed to be parallel is two lines. So E parallel, that means electrically parallel to that plane is same as Ex. I will provide this value. And then uh, the perpendicular value, the, uh, the electrically perpendicular to this plane is equals to E y, it is zero. And in one case, we might want to consider y z plane, this plane this whole plane. In that case, E parallel, that means the electric field parallel to that plane 
is zero because our electric field is along x direction. So the uh, polarization, uh, the parallel polarization is zero. In the other case, uh, the perpendicular one, the perpendicular to yz plane is ex and we use a uh, right hand rule. So there's a negative sign in front of that and we get the uh, ex, uh, EX polarization for perpendicular one. So we need this component and when you build up the model. Now I'm going to talk about another one, the plane wave incident on a spherical scatter. Uh, so in this one, uh, I'm going to talk about the mean solution to Maxwell's equation, commonly known as mu theory. And the mean simulator GUI we developed here about three years ago for this short course, and we are using the sentinels. So uh, in this case, we have incident field, incident upon this uh, scatter, and it will generate a uh, scattered field. We can divide the situation into two cases. Normally, we call uh, this is diameter as a reference. When diameter is much smaller than lambda, this uh, wave is passing through the scatter and uh, it, is, it is much smaller, so we will have a uniform electric field throughout the scatter. So there will be a single dipole, and this single dipole is emitting a scattered field. And when we have a uh, scatter which that's diameter is much bigger than the wavelength, then we have multiple dipoles, and they are emitting, emitting electric field in different direction. In this case, we get highly forward electric field, highly uh, forward distribution. Uh, let's look at this case in detail where the diameter is much smaller than lambda. We have a single dipole and uh, then oh, when you have oh. Hello. Uh, oh. single dipole, uh, the electric field is going like in this shape and it creates a donut shape. It's kind of a donut pattern uh, for electric field. Now we want to see the parallel polarization and perpendicular polarization of that one. So the, this is our incident polarization. So the light is oscillating in this direction and it hits on this spherical scatter and there will be a single dipole and it emits a scattered field. And then the scattered field generates a donor. And we want to see the polarization parallel to this one. So parallel to this direction means we have to cut along this YZ plane. Then we will end up with this kind of two uh, circles. This is what Watson showed in the morning. Uh, this is parallel polarization and when, when you consider the perpendicular polarization, so that we have incident po polarization uh, oscillate in this direction and we cut the plane perpendicular to this direction, that is uh, xz plane, then we will end up with a circle. That's why we get this kind of two different profiles for parallel and perpendicular uh, phase function uh, in uh, really scattering. Question? Yeah. In there, is C always the direction of the instant line? Yeah, just making sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions up here? is uh, actually raise the analytical solutions to Maxwell equation for an incident plane wave. Uh, we have to consider this one as incident plane wave if uh, the incident I mean, any 
other kind of goal, uh, this is not correct. So this, this is valid for pain mill. Uh, what we do uh, in this uh, theory is we have an incident field, then the scatter is there. It, it will have internal field and external field. We can write a spherical harmonics for incident field, internal field, and uh, uh, external field and solve that one and find out this coefficient. Okay. Once you find that coefficient, we can calculate the scattering efficiency. And when you have scattering efficiency, we can multiply that by the cross section to calculate the scattering cross section. Uh, also, this coefficient provides the scattering amplitude. We can calculate far field or near field amplitude uh, component of our amplitude scattering matrix uh, from the theory. And then finally, we can calculate the phase function. So, this is the new simulator group we are going to use next. In this one, we can uh, do uh, monodisperse or polydisperse. Here you input the refractive index for sphere and the medium, then you can set up the wavelength and the concentration. Uh, once you have all this information, just take one simulation. Uh, to calculate the scattering cross section first, then use number of scatterers uh, to calculate mu s. Uh, then use S1 and S2 values, the amplitude matrix component to calculate the phase function. Uh, S1 and you can look at the uh, shape of S1 and S2 here. Uh, once you have the phase function, we calculate the average cosine of phase function to calculate G. So we have this kind of phase function, we get the cosine and add them together to calculate the average cosine. Uh, when you have G and mu S, you can calculate mu S prime. Okay, so uh, the screen solution provides three dimensional scattering field. It means the, when we have a spherical scatter uh, and a plane wave incident, we will have a three dimensional uh, scattered field. We want to find the electric field at this location, the, um, in focus beam or any other uh, case where when we have a scattering field and incident field, uh, our idea is uh, to find the electric field at a particular location. To calculate that one, we need to know the incident electric field, we need to know the scattering field. If it is a spherical scatter, we can use mu theory to get the scattering field and then distance from the scatter to this point A. So this is, uh, so we have seen this one before. In this one we have an incident field here and the incident is polarized along x-axis. This is E incident. Now we want to find the polarization in this plane because we, we try uh, this angle called phi, this is asymmetrical angle and we want to get a general equation for this behavior. So we want to calculate what would be the electric field in this uh, plane this when the angle is phi. So that means we will have a uh, uh, electric field parallel to this plane, this is E parallel and there will be electric field perpendicular to this plane. We need to know those two components. How do we do, do that? What we, we multiply by this rotation matrix uh, uh, and uh, from that we can calculate the, oh, it should be parallel there. Uh, we can calculate the parallel and perpendicular uh, component of the electric field. That's how we calculate the, uh, Incident because when we consider this spherical scatter, if we consider this plane, the, the plane that is uh, parallel to x axis, then only the, this parallel component is equal to E incident and then uh, perpendicular component is, is equal to 0. But uh, if we consider any other plane, 
we have to apply this rotation matrix and calculate the correct uh, parallel and perpendicular component. Now we need to find the scattered electric field as, uh, at point A, this location. So this one provides the scattered field and the scattering amplitude is given by S2 uh, and S1. S2 is the parallel component, S1 is the uh, perpendicular component and then we multiply by the incident component because if this incident is high, this component will be high, if this is low, that will be low. So we have to multiply by the incident polarization component and then we have to multiply by the phase because the phase propagate from this point to that point. So the phase is changing when it is propagating. So when it is moving from this point to that point, it propagates KR distance. So that is a phase. And uh, this is a spherical wave. So we have to divide by 1 over R. So this is a, well, when you have a spherical wave, energy is dissipated in a wave. That uh, sphere is far away from the center. So we have to divide by 1 over R. So we will end up with this kind of a scattered field uh, intensity and we can write that one in matrix form. Uh, this is a parallel component, perpendicular comp incident component and we will end up with uh, this uh, scatter, uh, parallel, elect parallel uh, scattered electric field and perpendicular uh, uh, scattered electric field. So this is for spherical scatterers. Uh, in this one, uh, these two components are zero. But when we consider non-spherical scatterers, then we have more uh, elements in this matrix. Now, up to now, we consider plane wave and plane wave incident uh, upon a scatterer. So there is a reason for that because we can decompose, uh, we can represent this focus beam as a summation of plane waves. That's why we talk about plane waves. For that one we use this powerful principle called huygens fresnel principle. In huygens fresnel principle, when we consider a wave front, wave front means a wave with same exact phase, we can consider any location. In this case, this location and that location, we can consider any location and that location uh, uh, generate a spherical wave. So uh, from this location, we can consider a spherical wave in its outward. So that means that spherical wave can be decomposed into small wave components so, uh, and we can consider those small wave cons uh, components as plane waves, small plane waves going in this direction. So this wave, wave this one is a small plane wave going in this direction uh, and uh, other plane wave is going in that direction. Similar to if you take another location, this red wave is going in this direction, that direction. So we can consider all these spaces and uh, apply Huygens Fresnel principle to generate small plane waves. So now we decompose this focus beam into uh, plane waves. Then uh, look at this uh, principle applied in eight pattern for formation. In air pattern, uh, these kind of uh, plane waves uh, propagate and constructively interfere at the focal point and provide a high intensity point at the center. And then uh, other waves destructively interfere here and there and provide a uh, minimum amplitude at those locations. So this is known as AIL pattern. Uh, this is how it looked like if you uh, plot the intensity. And uh, the distance from center to the first minimum is known as AIL disk radius. And it is given by this equation. Uh, you can visit this website to 
get more information about a risk pattern. There's an exercise on uh, afternoon lab. Now, uh, let's look at this analytical solution uh, briefly. So in analytical solution, we have plane wave incident, an incident upon this lens, and then we generate a spherical, converging spherical wave and propagate towards the center. We can model that one. Yeah, the, this is the model. Let's simplify this one. So this is electric field at the lens surface. So that is electric field at the lens surface. The lens can be represented by a spherical cap in this case. So the, uh, the size of this spherical cap depends on the numerical aperture. If you have a small numerical aperture, this cap is going to be a small one. And if you have a bigger numerical aperture, it's going to be a big cap uh, because it's a, uh, uh, this angle is the uh, half angle uh, that is calculated from the numerical aperture. And then this part is the phase with respect to the focal point. Uh, this I, as, is, as soon as you see this I, that means this is phase. And uh, this part calculates the phase at any given location in this focal volume. The, the Z is the distance from this point, and rho is the uh, cross distance like R, and then V is the polarization. So it calculates the phase, and then we integrate this one. We integrate this one from 0 to 2 pi, that, is, that means whole spherical cap and then theta uh, 0 to theta max. 0 to theta max means the whole thing, whole cap. When you integrate this whole solution, that provides the electric field at any given location. So this is what we develop for this course, focus beam simulator GUI. And uh, this first column shows the results from analytical equation. And it, it is developed for non scattering medium or free space. And we use this one as our reference. Now, uh, here I'm going to talk about the model we develop and uh, how we come up, with, how we apply this one in non scattering case first. And then uh, I'm going to go to the scattering case. So in non scattering case, first we generate uniformly distributed points on the spherical cap. So this, this spherical cap is sample and then we find, uni uh, we put uniform, uh, we uniformly sample and find the point in this, on um, this spherical cap. And then we project wavelets from each radiating source to a uh, detector point. So we start from this point and we put, uh, consider a certain point and project all these wave or plane waves toward that point. Then uh, for each point we calculate the advancing phase. So simply what we did was earlier I discussed phase when we have incident polarization along a uh, given axis we can apply this rotation matrix to calculate the parallel and polarization components. Once we know that, we can use this propagation, uh, propagating phase. That means from this point to that point, there's a propagating phase. From K, B means that this distance. And then we can sum all these electric fields com coming into this point. And calculate the parallel component and then for the uh, we can do the same thing for the perpendicular component. But the problem is at this point the vectors are in different directions. We cannot add when vectors are in different directions. We need to project into known uh, directions. For that we project this one to x, y and z directions and we, cal uh, we add them uh, vectorially. So that's how we come up with this uh, interference. This is called interference. In, in vector, we add that, those vectors, but in 
life, what we do is actually interfere. When we compare this, uh, uh, compare our results with the analytical solution, and then we calculate the difference, and it works. So the, the, what we did was we apply simple concept and come up with this model in non-scattering case. Now the second step, uh, okay, before that, uh, let me show you this one. This is uh, the same V. The second panel shows the Huygen uh, of an wavelet approach. And when you click on incident, uh, you will get the results similar to the analytical solution. Now we are considering scattering medium. So we can have a scatter here, scatter there, and that provides a scatter medium. How we how we get how we uh, use that information uh, in our model? This is a technique we did. So we consider uh, this one, this point, as a uh, propagating point, and then. Whenever we want to calculate the uh, electric field at any given location, we propagate that uh, plane wave from this point to that uh, detector location. And when we, ha when we have two or more scatters, the scattered field from this one wave will be an incident on, on the other one, and vice versa because the scattered field from this one will be incident on that one. We consider that one. So we consider the primary scattering and secondary scattering. And we go on and calculate the tertiary scattering and we found that uh, when uh, it goes uh, sec uh, beyond secondary scattering, that value is so small. So we can neglect that one and we can consider only after the secondary scattering. And then this is the algorithm for uh, 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 this HF wavelet in a scattering medium. Similar to the previous one, we generate uniformly distributed points on this uh, spherical cap. And then project wavelet from each radiant source to a scatterer. So from this point to the scatterer. And then we cal uh, calculate the phase advance uh, from this point to that. It is here, this phase advance. And uh, then find scattering angle and distance from scatter to the scatter to the detector point. So we, we have we'll have a detector point somewhere here. Then we calculate the scattering angle and distance from this point to that point. And then we propagate that one. We, we use mu theory to find the scattered field uh, in that direction and we use that information here. After that, we, as before, we project everything into known coordinates, the x, y, z, and sum all the components. So to test our results, we compare with FTTD, uh, that is the gold standard. Uh, this is our technique and these are four different uh, uh, um, situations. In this one we put the scatter on optical axis, it is uh, slightly offset from optical axis uh, but close to the focal point. In this case it is 15 microns away from the focal point. In this case we put two scatters. And when we compare for 1 micron scatter, 2.5 and 5 micron scatter, our results are uh, comparable with FTTD results. And uh, when we look at the amplitude correlation as a function of scatter location, uh, what we did was uh, we calculated the scatter uh, uh, electric field without any scatter. And then we place the scatter at this location and check the uh, scattering field. And then we calculate the uh, correlation coefficient. If it is highly distorted, uh, it will be, uh, 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 if it is not distorted, it will be one. If it is distorted, it will be away from one. It will be a smaller value. 
So when we have one micron scatterer, uh, the scattering field is much small. Because of that, we don't see a, a big of uh, this amplitude correlation coefficient. But when you uh, put a 5 micron scatterer and put at different locations, you can see when the scatterer is at uh, this location, like 5 micron below the focal point, we will have a uh, small amplitude correlation coefficient that means very high distortion. And when you move downward, the scattering field effect is uh, reduced and it will move towards 1. Uh, other thing we look at is we check the axial displacement of the larger, largest amplitude point. So normally the largest amplitude point is at the focal volume, at the center of the focal volume. Uh, when we have a 1 micron scatterer uh, at this location, uh, we see a huge displacement. Uh, when we have a 5 micron scatterer, around 7-8 micron, we saw about 1.6 point displacement of scatter. So this is a huge thing because normally okay, it's going to focus at that particular plane, but now it is shifted by a certain distance. So this is only for single scatter. How about when we have multiple scatter? So those are the problems we need to think about and solve in the future. Uh, so, next exercise, uh, when you want to look at the total field, the incident field plus scattered field, just uh, click on this one, then you can see the distortion of the focal field. Uh, and this is the phase, you can see the distortion of the focal, uh, distortion of the phase, because this is evenly distributed focus and once you have a scatter at uh, this location, this is the scatter location and then the phase is distorted. Uh, let me go this panel quickly. So in this one, uh, you need to introduce a numerical aperture. Uh, uh, then uh, when you do uh, the medium with scatters, check on, check scatter one or two and input data and then run the simulation. You can find the results on XZ plane, that means vertical plane, or XY plane, it is horizontal plane. And you can calculate the electric field component EX, EY, and EZ. Uh, because we projected this one into EX, EY, EZ, uh, and we can combine that one, but it's better to look at each component separately so you can get the idea. And whenever you want to see details, you slug a scale. Okay, so that is my image. <laughs> and uh, we can go on to the next lab, yeah, lab B. And do you have any questions? Probably you have questions when you do this exercise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe you said it early on and it slipped out of my uh, brain, but um, your, your technique, the, the uh, HF WEFs, um, is, it, is it computationally more quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. The finite so, time domain. Yeah, so that results we can get in within two, three minutes. We are going to build and uh, to get results in that uh, using that uh, software. Okay, and um, on some of those side by side comparisons, did you ever take differences among them to see where the, where the discrepancies were and are they? Are they yeah, these plots, are, they, uh, are those discrepancies significant? And I can they are not significant. I can, I can and on the other hand, you have to consider the errors in FTTD. Even though it is considered as a gold standard, there are certain issues with uh, FTTD. Uh, as I mentioned before, the staircase errors, that's a one thing. And also, uh, you have to be 
There are a lot of things in FTDD. So uh, we, it's like we cannot compare that one. Okay, we cannot say that FTDD is the perfect one. There are some issues with FTDD. Yeah. But there are no significant difference between these two results, one, one single one. 